Good evening. Welcome to CAMS lecture. Our title tonight is a decolonial eco-politics for Bangladesh's forthcoming Krishna Chura period. We started the CAMS lecture series with the role and relation of Western powers with extremist Islam and moved on to the history of Bengal starting from as early as the Paul dynasty. The legacy of British colonial era in Bengal formed the perhaps the uh, largest or longest part of the lecture series related to Bengal. We have moved from British era to Pakistan episode and the last session was an extremely contested session to do with politics during the Pakistan era. The aim of tonight's lecture is to get a blueprint on how to declutter and structure our thought process to overcome impact and influence of our colonial past in order to shape a brighter future. Our lecturer tonight is Fuad Ali. Fuad Ali currently works as an engineer in the renewables sector. He grew up in London and developed his PhD research around the river erosion problem along the Jamuna River, which has, which has popularized families and communities for generations. Navigating chronic hazards, institutional life and socio-technical change is key to improving our condition but beset with colonial complications. Fascinated by the potential of a decolonial politics of knowledge and environment, he created a political art project called the Duriana Climate Delegation. This tracked the climate politics of a fictitious country that stormed the international state with uprightness and dignity. In this lecture and Q&A, he will draw out some lessons from the erosion experience and develop some scenarios for Bangladesh's climate modified future. We are happy to have Mr. Fuad Ali with us this evening. Few words about the format. We start with a brief into uh, about the intro, brief intro about the lecture, which lasts around five minutes, which I have already done. Then we'll go straight into the lecture, which is around 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and then it, the lecture will be followed by comments and Q&A section, uh, which will last around 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, today, we will have a five to 10 minutes uh, session at the very end, because we are um, concluding the episode uh, to do with Bengal, and we will be moving on to our next uh, lecture series. And um, Brother Naim Mahmood is going to um, talk to us, tell us about more about it. We observe a few rules before we get into the lecture. For the, we request the audience to keep the mic and mobile muted uh, until told otherwise. We encourage a discussion and debate, maintaining a professional and courteous approach. We also encourage attendees to take notes on the lecture for the comments and Q&A section. Without further ado, I would re request uh, Fuad Ali to deliver the lecture. Fuad Ali, the floor is yours. Yes, I just assume they're there. Okay, while we're waiting for the slides, just wanted to uh, say thank you for your time. I know it's hard to block out some time in your afternoon. Um, you might be wondering, oh, I actually didn't have the word Bangla in the title because um, I wanted to, part of the idea of the decolonial approach I wish to take is to kind of denationalize as much as possible. But you might be worried, wondering where this Krishna Chura period comes from. Um, I think in history, um, there was this period in the late Ottomans in tulip gardens it's called the tulip period. Um, Alhamdulillah, as a as a as a time where the secularist Islamist left right fault lines are not so painfully unproductive and where we. Um, it's a politically enabling time. So it's just a horizon where people can do things. Okay, um, next slide. And it's a beautiful horizon, inshallah. Um, 
Next slide. So I had these questions that I wanted you to just know about while I'm talking over some slides. Um, the first one's the main thing, uh, and this was the focus of my PhD and much of what I'm concerned with these days. How can our discourses, our organizations, our programs, educational, cultural, political, and our practices and ethics be better adapted to thrive through these climate modified futures? Um, one of the things you might notice is that uh, anti colonial politics tend in, in our part of the world tends to be um, decoupled from environmental issues and environmental campaigning globally until recently has been decoupled from anti-colonial politics. There's this whole, there's this intersection and Bangladesh's geopolitical and ecological situation does mean that anybody trying to contribute to it needs to be able to tackle this, um, the myriad of environmental factors with its political approach which requires sensitivity to knowledge production, uh, grassroots knowledge production and participation in this adaptation and uh, the colonial complications, which I'll talk about later. The second part is, um, and how do we look at, how do we see uh, Bangladesh adapting in the future? We could look at how it's adapted in the past and the erosion problem, Nodi Pangon, is, has some resemblance to the coastal erosion problem. Uh, okay, there's no salt, but it removes lots of land from the system up to a kilometer a year. So, you know, from embankment up to Tottenham Court Road or something like that, you know, in a year. And I wanted to talk about some, uh, some scenarios. And I, I think these are threefold. They're three kind of interlocking ones, if you can think of it. If you can think of uh, climate Guantanamo, where Bangladesh becomes a Gaza type situation trapped between India, Burma and the sea. Uh, and the war on terror discourse and the Malthusian, the kind of the environmental discourses collide destructively. And it's quite a despairing thing. And we see how um, the climate Guantanamo discourse is actually present in Bangladesh in a way now. The, the second one is, Brak, I call it Brakotabad, where, yeah, there's not that thing as politics, just run some NGOs, people give up. You can see people have often given up on Desh, maybe they'll do some Bina Poisha cards, but the big political questions and the challenges, um, it's just uh, where to start. And then with these two um, kind, of kind of slightly um, default scenarios, there's this Krishna Chura period where we get some things right. Um, and, and this Krishna Chura period requires what I'm calling socio-technical creativity. Um, technological change is social and social change is also technological. So they just coupling that together, um, we can see a broader picture. And I want to just talk about where we've seen that in river erosion and how we might just, uh, whenever we see these conditions and these phenomenon happening, we should just go and support and maybe leave some of our Kalashnikovs at the door and get involved. Could you have the next slide, Pai? Right, some terms. Um, The decolonial approach is a little bit, it's, it's quite similar to anti and uh, post-colonial approaches, but it comes from a different geographical experience. It comes from Latin America, writers like Walter Mignolo, they write about the decolonial turn and the decolonial turn is where you um, decenter European universalism. In engineering, let's think about this, what this means in monsoon uh, colonial climates like Bangladesh. Civil engineering uh, is generally born out of a temperate 
UK experience where the water distribution, the precipitation from the sky, is quite even over the year, right? In Bangladesh, it's very exaggerated, right? Very, very dry, very, very wet. So you can see that sometimes the tools of engineering, before even going into governance and organization and taxation and land, um, they're kind of derived from a provincial way of looking at the world. So the idea is you, you don't ignore the European experience, you provincialize it. You say, that is from here. I might be able to learn from it, but I'm not trapped by that. I don't have to use those tools. There's more possibilities. The decolonial approach also entangles science and politics and the politics of science. Sometimes we take science as a given. Um, in my experience in Bangladesh, which is much less than everybody else's here, um, we attach a lot of weight to institutions, Dhaka University, Buet, um, colonial institutions, which we need to get ahead and survive for our families, but which are implicated in colonial power and reproduce colonial power and relations. For example, amongst engineers, you have degree engineers and you have diploma engineers and they both have different unions and there's this power class divide between the two. Um, and we can see that there's a political tussle. If you are um, in your local area, if you have trouble and you'd like to have, you'd like to approach a solution to that trouble, you're more likely to get support from a diploma engineer than a degree engineer because the diploma engineer Although they may not know advanced calculus, they'll be more like you and they'll try to problem solve with you. And this has been seen in the, in, in the past. Um, I wanted to talk about colonial junctions and continuities. The way land is demarcated and organized in Bangladesh is very much following on from uh, British survey, Indian survey um, type period, only slightly um, less technically adept. The, the Nokshas that we had in the past, now they're subdivided. Um, yeah, and uh, it's a problem when land gets removed from the system. By colonial junction, I just wanted to talk about where things meet. For example, when there's a big bad flood in Bangladesh and lots of donors come to help out, um, and there's lots of flows of finance into organizations. And it um, is good in some ways, but in other ways, um, it reduces people's um, ability to solve problems. If we go to South America for a minute, in countries like Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, um, these have all been struggling with European colonialism and ideas of plurinationalism and uh, the rights of Mother Earth have emerged in, in this hot cauldron. Uh, the countries of South America, they don't come to a climate conference with a begging cap in hand, talking about their victimhood. They say, no, this is our environmental ideology. Earth is living, Earth has rights. It is against our, our, our law, our religious national law to tamper with the genetic material of organisms and other such things. They, they approach climate discussions like that. They contest the fundamental nature of the world, right? And I think that's interesting, especially because we are Muslims and um, Surah Zalzala has the earth as a live feminine. Um, and we have a discourse of the rights of nature we have all of this content. It's not like there's nowhere to start for us if we want to get into this. Um, I also think decolonial approaches are useful for Bangladesh, but we need to nuance them because we are nested. There's this European um, experience with different European countries, but there's also the Brahminical experiences. There's our own amateur caste system. And then Southeast Asia, we have China and other places. So. We can't, one of the problems of uh, decolonial um, language is it's coming out of the Atlantic experience. 
very powerful, very potent, very useful, but we need to think with it for a little while. It's not going to solve all of our problems. We still do have, um, we do make our own problems as well, right? So that's just to unpack the term decolonial. So what we're do, trying to do with decolonial is decenter Europe and embark on our own adventures with partners and friends. We're not, um, it's distinct from de-Westernization, which is maybe a bit more reactionary and hurt. Um, yeah. Uh, horizons, I mentioned Brakotabad is heavy, is a future where there's heavier NGO industrialization. So donors, uh, people perhaps of a more secular liberal persuasion uh, have greater power, authority, and accountability. The climate Guantanamo, where you add this uh, terrorism, Muslim terrorism, uh, the menacing Muslim in Alungi, um, you add that to the mix. But this Krishna Chura period, I wanted to say, is where we are, our people are the socio-technical landscape architects of the Delta. Okay, could you go to the next slide? Next slide. I also wanted to introduce this idea. This is a slightly disempowering idea, but I think you might like it. Um, it's uh, just a schematic. It's, it's a model of what I call developmentia. You know, when you have a wealthy patron and poorer people without so much agency and how a patron will use um, somebody to um, do his work. So the red, the red spot there is who I call the development tour. This could be, perhaps it's the NHS, perhaps it's the World Bank, perhaps it's uh, a government, perhaps um, it's a big funding agency like Bill and Melinda Gates. A development T is someone like me, like Naeem Pai, we might work with such an organization because they have funds for us. They provide us with comfort, a bit of kudos. Oh, look, he's got his PhD from here. He's had a big role in a big company in the West. They give us some control. You often give up your political struggle once you work for a development tour. And um, you allow them to clone themselves on you. In turn, the development tea provides the development tour with legitimacy. If nobody took Bill Gates seriously, he wouldn't be able to do anything. They support him. They have talent. We have talent. Um, they give confidence and they also give security. Now, what's that got to do with the general people or society? Well, this, it's quite critical here because developmentia is quite deceptive. They will use um, poor people or victims um, for propaganda purposes, for PR, uh, as a blank slate to write ideologies of, of you know, it could be any ideology, it could be Islamist ideology. This model is neutral on that, I guess. This opportunity is not likely to challenge what you write about them. They don't have the same right of audience. So as well as being a big deception, it's also uh, quite paralyzing. So where in some countries with a healthier political life, you will have movements, political movements, energy, challenge. Here you have just you know, kind of blank, passive subjects paralyzed by like a patient on a saline drip. Actually, they need a big shock. They need to get up you know, but um, this saline drip is keeping these old forms alive and keeping the developmental and the developmenty in power. So I call this arrangement of affairs. You might think, I see it everywhere. That's my problem. Um, I call this development share. And there's a website here where there's loads of content on this. And, you know, these arrows, a lot of these are voluntary, but a lot of them are in parte. So that's as technical as I want to get. Now I'm going to talk about um, the research I did about 10 years ago. 10, 15 years ago.
okay if they're hearing me. I, I can I can confirm. I can hear you well, okay. loud and clear. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? I think the next slide, yes. One of the big goals, um, it doesn't. In the, not like with new nuclear science or this kind of um, NASA type of program. Continue. Oh, Naimba is back. He's back. Yeah. So not the it's 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 one of the big ones, and it's very it's very difficult. You have river erosion on small rivers, which is more manageable, but on the Jamuna River, it's a 10 kilometer wide braided stream. And uh, it's very challenging. I think nobody really has control over it. If you're, if you're a big town like Siraj Gonj and there's a bridge near you, you might get some protection, but it's still, there's still a lot to play for. So uh, somebody told me uh, in, in the interviews, they kindly shared this nugget with me, which I found quite vivid. Um, when you're mugged, you can go home. And when that home is burnt to the ground, you can even build a new home. When your home is eroded, you do not even have the land beneath your feet. So yeah, it's uh, many of you probably know people who've had um, river erosion in their background and you can see big landlords become paupers in a couple of days. You can see somebody like a teacher who's identity is contained around a community totally losing that identity when that community is displaced around them so it's pauperizing it's displacing it's socially disintegrating just like we saw with towns like Sarajevo as the Austro-Hungarian empire empire drew close where we saw with with partition you get this elite depletion which we're quite good at where the well-heeled and well-educated get the hell out of Dodge, leaving um, more def humbler, um, defenseless, assetless people there. Um, it's it's something to, to, to be marked on. There's lots of social work there for people to do, and people are. It's a long-standing problem, and it's got to do with soil and the water regime. Of course, um, as people try to connect everything to climate, change there will be some uh, relationship there but this has been going on for time um, generations ago there was an earthquake in Assam which put a whole megatons of earth into the Jamuna Brahmaputra system then the, there was an earthquake which tilted the region a little so the old Brahmaputra channel became this moribund mess and this channel that goes down through Sirajagunj um, became the major channel so there's always a change in this big river system and bangladesh constitutes just seven percent of the land area of the basins it drains seven percent which means uh okay it's great you have your economic independence from india but if you're going to do that you're going to need to have very good soil water management you know to deal with um, upstream withdrawal release, but also the inherent physical um, phenomena of river erosion. Soft river banks, lots of sand and sediment in the water, it's going to erode. So this challenges technology and society uh, institutionally and collectively. And um, yeah, as you all are aware, development, poverty, and disaster are big politics and business in Bangladesh. So I'm just going to share some more findings from the study. It was done at King's College between 2004, 2009. Um, next slide. So it's a little bit dated, but I do think about it a lot. Um, this is the area, um, and this map is probably around 2008. Um, it's a false color image from space. So where you see red, 
is actually green vegetation. Okay. And there you can see the braid belt coming from the north to the south. And here we see the black line is the riverbank from 1973, where we had some satellite pictures. And those green luminous lines are Moza borders, right? So the, and they're, the top four are from Gaibanda, the bottom four are from Bogra, the, the middle four are from Bogra, the, the bottom four are from, um, Sorry if you've seen this slide before, Ahmedullah Bay especially. So you can see that each of these areas has had a slightly different experience with erosion over time. Look at Shubhagotcha, that's been quite, you know, a generation ago, or in the time of the Bangladesh War, that river was 10, 10, 20 kilometers away. And now it's pretty much finished, finished them. Um, other guys, like say, Gazaria, Gazaria, um, say that's kind of near full Charikat. That's been living with it for quite a long time. And only recently, relatively recently, had the UNO office been destroyed and moved. So you've got diversity of experience, like you have diversity of experience of Bangladeshi diasporas when they came from Bangladesh, really um, shaped the outlook. Similarly here, um, can we have the next slide? Um, this is what a young brother was telling me. Um, and yeah, I'm going to skirt over it, but it's a very deep experience and it's a very horrible experience. And uh, the whole point of public care, public engineering is to protect people. And um, yes, this is a challenge. We don't, we're not interested in the moon in Bangladesh. We're interested in what I'm calling the Krishna Chura period where you, where we all become the social ecological architects of this delta area. That's water engineering, soil engineering, not NASA. Um, we're becoming poorer with time. Look at this area, it's breaking. Our house is breaking, our belongings will become ruined. I will become poorer and poorer like this. Everyone in the family is trying to locate land. So that's just a view of what's happening during erosion. And I think I was that guy's age at the time as well. Uh, Shimla is interesting. I'm going to show you a photo of Shimla at the end, because the local MP was Nassim, this Awami League um, Home Minister, and he tried to do something, but it messed up in the end, unfortunately, for them. Can we have the next slide? And this was from a teacher in Bogra. When I was taking the interviews, it was BNP Jamaat time. Um, and yeah, this headmistress, headmistress of a school was 31 years old. I don't know what's going on there. Nearly 100% of the pupils have erosion backgrounds at the school. Sometimes you hear things that make you cry. Uh, one child was falling asleep in class and asked me, I'm hungry, please, miss, send me home. The guardians are very poor. So you can't really learn when you're hungry. It's very hard for educational institutes to, to, to work. Often the government does the modeling studies and they'll determine that these government buildings are at risk. And then what they'll do is they'll disassemble the bricks, sell the bricks. They might not reestablish the school, which is quite bad for locals, but from a government point of view, it's preserving. I saw lots and lots of battles in the river erosion areas to preserve local institutions, especially educational institutions. We saw the religious institutions, people would just move them and make them again, move them and make them again. Sometimes I, I got one which was, it moved six times in 20, 30 years, right? Um, people love their institutions and they want to keep them and we need to make the conditions for them to stay with the people. This area at Dhap, Bogra was right next to Sharia Kandi. So it's a slightly more developed area and had river protection. Um, so next slide. So now we're going on to more generic findings. Um, over half of the institutions, and by that I mean temple, madrasa, school, can be high school, primary school, mandir. Right? Um, over half of them in this area had been displaced. So the kind of like refugees, you can see lots of refugees in the area. 
Cohesion had been lost and social conflicts and insecurity were high. Um, not to valorize elites, but one of the function of people of standing is to solve problems and, you know, yeah, solve problems. Um, elites tend to desert the riverbank areas and um, locals would miss their ability to negotiate local local benefits. So if you wanted to keep a school in your area, it would help to have some uh, degree holders or high school graduates or people of standing that the government would take seriously enough to keep, you know, to take them serious. Often then, it, otherwise it descends into a little bit of violence, which, yeah, conflicts are like that. Um, rehabilitation is stressed less by local people because they don't think they're going to get their land back. They just move on. Locals mobilized their own resources, however limited, to build earth embankments. Often the professional engineers would think this was quite pathetic or they'd help them out. But this is one of the sites where I think people need to support. If local people are building a band, you, you know, just support them with whatever you can. In the face of a Jamuna River, it seems quite pathetic, but in the scale of what our society is going through, I think um, that's very, very important. As well as, you know, was one thing that came up, and because I was listening for this as a non-secular researcher, as well as Nodi Pangon, people would talk about Joritra Pangon, um, ethical qualities, loss of character, are observed to depreciate across the board. And maybe there's something to do with poverty and pauperization here that people need to study. Often I would hear statements that combined intellect and morality at the same time. This, uh, this guy, 22 year old, he was very, a very, a lot of insight. Um, he owned a small mobile phone shop that was just looking at the river all day. Good people have the light of learning. They won't cause people trouble. The educated here tried to make fools of the uneducated. So it's, it reminds me of this amateur Brahminical system that we have going on in Bangladesh, where um, often people who should know better use their intellectual resources to trick people. And people know that, can't do much about it. Can you have the next slide? Oh. This was a really inspiring story. It didn't have much directly to do with river erosion, but it did have to do with the water development sector. And it's the story of the Tista Barrage. And I got to speak with uh, Siraj al-Islam, who ran the project on the Tista Barrage. And he's a sweet old man. I don't think he's alive, but um, he talked about the role of leadership in being catalytic translating aspirations into practical reality. I often think of it as resources, talent, yeah, and kind of institutional direction can cause things to get done, good things to get done. And for some quirky reasons, the Tista Barrage actually got built and finished. A big project needs a big leader with a big vision. During the Tista project, General Zia had to fight two forces. The BWDB, that's the Bangladesh Water Development Board officials who were anti-Zia, and the World Bank who preferred tube well pumping. And the Tista project was an irrigation project for Northwest Bengal. Zia had seen the advantages of irrigation advantage earlier in West Pakistan and was a real modernizer. He visited me in the first week by helicopter and was very impatient. He scolded me. For, work, for not working faster. Then he embraced me saying, Mr. Islam, you have taken my burden. He continued to visit every three months until he was assassinated. Zia was daring and impatient. Irshad, Zia's successor in national leadership, was from Rongpur, local, and supported the, the Tista project, but he was not like Zia. I have not seen much influence from ministers other than biasing. The government remains too busy with politics to think of planning. It's a nice story. Um, Tista project is not like heaven, um, but it's a big mega, mega project and the engineers across the country love it. In fact, whenever they're indoctrinating young graduates into the organization, they take them there. 
I remember visiting the the Tista project and it made my head it made yeah it's really impressive you have there's this place where you have a, a canal and you have a river going underneath it the siphon very very smart stuff doesn't solve land district uh, land inequality but um and it's not really resilient to indian um big indian works but it's 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 an example of what people can do could you have the next slide i'm i'm nearly done there's another speaking to the the murabi engineers was really good i i uh i can't recommend people you know you should if you get the chance, always talk to these people because they've seen a lot and they've had to work in very difficult circumstances with very little stuff, right? Very little resource. There's expertise and aspiration in the water resource sector and leadership to address the river erosion issue, but a lack of confidence. So here we have Siraj al-Islam again, and he's talking about reputation. During the Ganges Kobadak project, which is a Pakistan era project, even the terrorists respected the Wapda engineers. Wapda is the, the Pakistan era name of the BWDB. It included power at the time. Reputation is very difficult to recover. It sticks to your works. Very interesting there. You make something and, and people's impression of you, your organization, the country is connected to it. I know that if anything happens to the Tista barrage, every water engineer in Bangladesh will rush there. Whereas some of the river erosion protection structures, there's not so much attention. These were made by maybe Korean um, contractors. There was little participation. The Tista project had Deshi money expertise, right? Both of those things were involved. And they were in the design of it. They were not disempowered from the design process. Here's something else you might want to think about it. I know some members of CAMES have something to do with ABP and this would be a really easy technocratic fix if someone could do it. The annual development cycle, first week of June, does not match the monsoon cycle. Engineers lose credibility when they end up having to construct works in the few months before the water rises. So imagine it's June, water is quite high. You can't see what's going on. You can't see what land has been lost. You have to wait maybe November, October. You can send some surveys out. Goes to the, the procurement cycle. Maybe you're in January, February, and you've got three, four months to do some work. It's not optimal. And you end up doing half, half cock work. The budget to tender to work order process is lengthy. Look, it's July. Some of the last money has just arrived. If we don't get funds on time, we can't maintain the Brahmaputra right embankment. River erosion work brings us a bad name. And this was from a really lovely uh, diploma engineer from Guy Bandha who sat with me. Um, they see things. Next slide. And I work in operations and maintenance now, and it's, it's similar, actually lots of bureaucracy that you need to be light footed with. Uh, fourth finding is about donor, the donors and, and the idea of dignity. For lots of reasons, we're not a particularly economically bountiful uh, community at the moment. And this has problems. It, it exacerbates itself in these technical issues. So here we go. And this is from I spoke to somebody from IDEB. This is the Institute of Diploma Engineers, Bangladesh. Nice guy. Um, everyone wants well for us, but we have a funding problem. We ask the donors, who then ask for their consultants. And that is a very disempowering process. It is our luck. World Bank loan conditions are good in terms of the interest rate, but the consultancy takes a huge amount of the benefit. The World Bank doesn't work for poor people. They use luxurious consultants who buy 700 taka blocks for 3,000 taka. These blocks are these reinforced concrete blocks, which you often would dump into the river because um, 
you'd get these whirlpools which go really, really deep and undermine any building work that you've had there. Often at peak flood, peak flood erosion time, there's, there's a lot of panic over the structures. So here we go. The foreign engineers were extravagant. They, international company, probably Hyundai, I, don't, I can't remember, were the biggest thieves and scoundrels. They gave subcontracts willy-nilly. I'm not saying that the public sector is not, that they're not thieves and scoundrels. It's just um, no one has a monopoly on that. Um, I spoke to this really interesting engineer. I hope he's still alive. Um, I think his name was Aminul Islam. Um, and his wife was an engineer as well. And unlike most Bangladeshi families, they didn't, of that class, they didn't have any people working in their house. So he sat and he sat with me and told me lots of things, some of which might be true. The local government engineering department, and this was founded by the late um, Kamal Islam Siddiqui, is being patronized by the donors, as it doesn't have its own expertise. Its work is easy, but no one was doing this easy work before. You know, these interdistrict roads, which have really helped things. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, roads and highways, uh, the government department, had a strong design section like the water boards, but they cannot design. It's been destroyed by the donors. The donors are now in the process of destroying the water board. So yeah. Next slide. So you can see the kind of colonial politics, the modern day colonial politics of expertise. We want expertise. We want to nurture expertise at all levels. And also the manners and social structures to distill wisdom to create the best structures and social relations along the riverbank. And then we have another issue, and sometimes this is our fault, often just fighty, fighty fault. Um, discontinuity, institutional discontinuity. Very hard that Britain has not really been invaded for about a thousand years. Things are quite stable. Right. They talk about Brexit and things like that and austerity, but um, it, the institutional instability is nothing compared to where we come from. The internationalized flood action plan of the 1990s reduced Bangladeshi engineers to thumb suckers. Thumb suckers was the word used. This is somebody in design section on Green Road. Through though junior professionals, People like myself learned a few things. Actually learned a lot. The young people, the young professionals really enjoyed this period and they benefited most. Um, when you're denied the scope to determine your own mistakes, design, experiment, um, these learning events are incomplete. The National Hydraulic Labs in Faridpur, the River Research Institute, was just, uh, it was foreigners basically designing the experiments there. People didn't, the money came from abroad, great, but people could not really fuse their understanding with that resource. It was, it developed someone else's expertise, someone who wasn't accountable to, to the people there. The World Bank decimated the Water Development Board in the name of rationalization and water sector improvement. It was a massacre, reducing the numbers from 18,000 in 2000 to about half in 2007. Uh, geo government of Bangladesh political discontinuity did not help, but as a result, there was a 10-year recruitment freeze. So nobody from Buet's water resource department from that master's could get in. Imagine that. The World Bank has kind of constipated the production line of engineers, right? And then you've got the other problem that people would enroll on master's degrees just waiting to get the scholarship to go to Canada, UK, America. But that's, that, that's the global connection of kind of the brain drain circulation that we also need to address. This issue of uh, discontinuity comes to a head when we talk about spatial nepotism. And it's a big feature in local institutional establishments to rural hinterlands. The River Research Institute was moved from Dhaka to Faridpur. They said their benefit is some of, some of our guys will get jobs, but 
um, when you have to compete with modeling and GIS remote sensing methods of knowing the river, it really places you at a disadvantage. Nobody wants to go, no, Paul, they were troubled. and journal posts and that was really tragic because there's so many smart people in Dash but so kids yeah and so these movements of institutions are extremely retarding to the development of high cost engineering as engineers are put under extreme pressure to comply with political wishes overstretch and oops can we go back one second Go, go back one. Yeah. They overstretch their design and are denied maintenance. So if, oh, hello. South Bay had a question. Please, can you write it there or maybe leave it for the, if you want to intervene here, that's great. I'm open to that. South Bay? No, no, I, I will, we'll leave it for the, uh, for the uh, comments and discussion session, please. Well, go ahead. Okay. Engineering life in Bangladesh. Yeah. And they, a lot of them are written in my thesis in the penultimate chapter. And I'm happy to email it to anybody who asks for it or is interested. Um, yeah. If you build something and you don't get a maintenance budget. Hello, Kamalvai. Could we have the next slide? If you build something, you don't have a maintenance budget, it basically dies. The Jamuna River is the hardest place to build anything. I cannot think of anywhere, maybe outer space, you know, which is more difficult to build in. The Piper's Tune, there we go. I, I've, I've been here before, I think. You know, they, they say the Piper calls a tune. He who has the funding, the developmental determines the tune, whether it's the fashions of international uh, water engineering or human rights or climate change discourse, the Piper calls a tune. You develop your um, funding proposals and desires de depending on the Piper's tune. So the decolonial turn is to develop our own tune. Okay, so next slide. I've nearly finished and name by oh. just uh, yes so this is what I talk about uh, I mentioned there was this area called Shimla there were three attacking spurs built here during the reign of the Awami League and there was a local minister called Nassim who made sure that this area got some protection but this structure didn't get a uh, maintenance and a sufficient maintenance budget, and maybe it wasn't the right structure because you don't even you don't even know if these things, these expensive structures are failing because your engineers are rubbish, the design was rubbish, or the maintenance was rubbish. It's so hard. So here's a view, and we we can see that this attacking spur it was a set of three has been completely undermined. Behind these boats, behind me, is a secondary school. And that secondary school, there's a hot battle to move that secondary school. It's probably gone now. And the locals were actually fighting the teachers. Uh, it was torn, obviously. But the headmaster over reality, I, as I've had children, I understand this in a new way, where the school is a focus of learning for so many people. So yeah, um, yeah, Muslim made is climate relief could do stuff here. So next slide, please. The decolonial approach mind the politics of knowledge. 
remember that the Muslim League doesn't get founded until you know the education in politics are kind of connected. We have this colonial time annual development plan. Every year there's a lefty engineer who writes an article of why don't we have our budgets to match the Bangla New Year? And if Bangla nationalism could have one beneficial use would be to move that um, to move that cycle up a couple of months and shape it to the climate. We need to match the budget and monsoon cycle. This is a no-brainer. Then there's uh, the bread and butter issue of young people who want to solve problems and really talented people going to Buet, Ruet, Kuwet, Chuet, and um, being on the global periphery of knowledge and wanting to learn and facilitating their learning. I was lucky, I had some privileges, middle class um, person in charge of one of the institutes was his social body was near my body and I caught loads of data that people wouldn't get. No? Competing knowledge matters. For river erosion, imagine there's three kinds of knowledge. Hydraulic modeling, which is old school, big flume tax scale models of rivers. Right? You need a lot of space. Then you have uh, computational modeling. That's the Institute of Water Modeling. But it's, it's quite colonial there because that's Danish software they use and they didn't program it themselves. We've got lots of clever people who could program things, but it's a black box, a private company from Denmark developed this software on Bangladesh's rivers with foreign aid, but we do not have access to the insides of it. Funny, right? And then there's the other one, the satellite imagery. We don't, that's colonial also because we do not own the satellites. We have to purchase data, right? And it's a very government view. It's very difficult to create science that's useful for people on the ground. Disciplinary taste. I had a long chat with somebody from civil engineering who was interested in soil mechanics and soil dynamics. He said that water resources was this prevailing international doctrine and it was limited in how it could help us with river erosion because we're looking at the liquefaction of soil and we need to think about the soil more because it's a problem the product is of the soil and the water and the sediment in the water so you know when you frame a technical or social problem in an incomplete way you're missing some of the jigsaw puzzle right disciplinary taste matters and you know people compete for resources with whiteness in this country i spoke about the brahminical privileges of the degree engineers vis-a-vis -vis the diploma engineers, but also think of the erosion victims. I met people, I met this Hindu guy who had a master's in mathematics and lived by a river, but somehow his educational experience did not include the fluid dynamics of that river next to him. Interesting to me. There's another issue here of, um, and I'm just talking about politics of knowledge, just it comes up again and again and again, and we need to be able to navigate this well. Personal conflict. We had, an, I had a case of a professional engineer who had been uh, defrauded by an academic who took his ideas, wrote them up nicely for a foreign funder, got some money to do bundling work on Minor River. This guy was disempowered and quite bitter about it. You have personal animosities and ambitions in the mix. And then the idea, the final idea I wanted to tell you was, was of social distance, distancing, whose knowledge matters. The government's knowledge, the engineer's knowledge, the politician's knowledge, the victim's knowledge of, 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 of this. So if we think of people who are going to have to adapt to climate change, whether it means moving their house, protecting their crops, changing their crops, changing their livelihood uh, strategies, very, very difficult stuff. Whose knowledge matters? The economists, the, in the, the government engineers, or their muscles, their muscles, the training we give each other, how we sharpen each other. Um, so I think the general gist of my um, presentation today, I hope, if it makes any sense, is that we need to decrease the social distance. We've been socially distancing from a year for 
more than a year. We've been socially distancing for 250 years. We need to attend to our our problems by creating knowledge which works in our communities. And that doesn't involve ignoring what happens in academies, wherever they are, but it needs to be nurtured inside society. So we need to be science literate. We need to be able to navigate spiritual, uh, physical, social knowledge worlds without um, just uh, discounting each other. Uh, next slide, I think that might be the end. That might be the final slide. Um, oh, and that's the picture of Mir Jafar, by the way. You probably know it well. So finally, eco-politics. Our environmental politics is greater than Indian hydrohegemony. In this country, um, the Tories have an eco-politics, which is to make money from offshore wind and to preserve old uh, preserve the environment to keep their status quo. The Labour Party has an eco-politics which is to uh, generate taxes. Right? Our eco-politics needs to be maybe inspired by Sayyidina Khidr to be transformative, to be um, yeah, part of witnessing. It's connected to river erosion, it's connected to um, animal rearing, it's connected to cropping. We need to have a, a very rich discussion in this area. Cannot let bioethics be monopolized by fat, obese um, Arabs who are thinking about how they can have kids, right? Our, the bioethics of Bangladesh, uh, our needs, our scientific material needs need to be at the forefront of our Islamist discourse, our scientific discourse. I don't know how you do that if you don't have any money, but you have to try, right? Inequalities in scientific knowledge creation are challenging. They're multi-scalar and they're dynamic. We know this, we have often railed against things like Tagore and partitions of Bengal. Epistemic politics and inequalities and exclusion are part of Bengal Muslim history. Now let's try to make it productive right and here's the one here's the one constructive alignment of talent values and resources are rare whenever you see it run at it yeah and support it leave kalashnikovs at the door let's let it let it grow please um and then i had this long statement which i'm going to conclude on uh and this wasn't a really academic presentation this is this is polemical too uh we need to make a strategic commitment to nurturing, to, to nurturing flatter, by which I mean less hierarchical, ep epistemic pluralism, intellectual cosmopolitanism. Bring your Sanskrit, bring your Chinese stuff, bring your Middle Eastern knowledge, bring your knowledge, your experience, your grandmother's experience to the table. I'm gonna make things. And this disciplinary cosmopolitanism from the gram to the ministry, to the institute, to the community. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fuad Ali, for uh, preparing the presentation and the lecture, uh, delivering the lecture uh, this uh, today. Uh, we thank you all for taking part and making valuable contribution in the discussion. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing you in the next lecture as well. Uh, with that, uh, we are closing our lecture tonight, and we see you all at the next lecture. Bye for now. Thank you.